Let me see. I had a Victrola when I was five years old. I still got it. It was my father's. And neighbors would bring records by. And I was fascinated by records. Later on, when I got into my <clears throat> 12 years old or so, I heard, I like Gene Autry. So I went around, looked for Gene Autry records. And um, then one time I heard Jimmy Rogers. That's, that did it. And I went to the record store. It was 1948. I wanted anything you got by Jimmy Rogers. And they went through the book. Never heard of him. See, but by that time, Victor had pulled all that stuff off. I think it was 45. They pulled all the last records like that. They were on Bluebird and Carter family, all repressed. So I heard where he had uh, sold so many records. So I started going out and asking. And there was a woman sitting on the stoop on the street. And I asked her, and she said, yeah, I've got some. And she bought a box out. Must have been 50 records in it. And says, let's take them. And there was two Jimmy Rogers in there. But there was some other stuff. Things I like. Hey, I like this too. I don't like this guy. You know, this and that and this and that. But the, the real thing came when I got my driver's license when I was 16. Then I went all over the place. <clears throat> That's when I ventured down into Virginia and found Carter family. And I loved them. You know, I didn't know a thing about records. I mean, who, how many were made and who or what, you know, and all that I had to learn as I went. But um, I went every day I could. So you were going to people's houses door to door, just randomly. Well, I could look at the house and say, you know, I don't want to go to a new house. You don't want one that's old looking in there. <laughs> and the, the, I bought them off the people that bought them because they were in their 60s then, you know, maybe 70. So they had them and they kept them. I went up to this door one time and knocked on the door and I looked through the screen door and I said a big wind up in the hallway. I said, oh boy, I got to turn on the charm. <laughs> 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 and I, you know, people sold them. They didn't. Yeah, they, nobody wanted them, really. I mean, they weren't worth anything then. And um, I went all over the place, met people everywhere. So I went out on the weekend, come home with 500 records, a couple of dollars a stack, sometimes 50 cents a piece, a quarter a piece. Oh, let me see. I went, well, the one time I went on this hunt, I, I hit a bunch of houses and found some nice records, and they kept telling me about this old lady that had records. But the way they described it, it was like 25 miles away on 10 back roads. <laughs> so I really didn't play all that much attention, you know. And uh, I, I made I went on all kind of roads here and there and here and there. And I came down the road, and there was this old house set on the right side of the road, if I remember. And it looked good. I, it looked like if you raised the wind up, records would slide out. <laughs> and there was an old man on the porch, and... Uh, I asked him, no, we never had none of them talk machines. But you see that mailbox down there? And I said, yeah. He said, that old lady's got all kind of records back there. So <clears throat> I went, and it was a foot uh, um, path. You had to walk back. <clears throat> you couldn't, you know, you couldn't drive back. It was about a mile. And I went over a foot log, <clears throat> over a creek, up over a hill, and there was a house. Old stone house, and smoke coming out of the chimney. This was in the summertime. I went and knocked on the door. Is this 1950s? Yeah, early 60s, probably. Come on in. Well, in that situation, you got to let them know that you're a stranger. You know, you're a strange person. You know, if it's a local person, they just walk right in. But I didn't do that. I, I, you know, I let them know who, that I wasn't around that locally, you know. And she had a big wind-up stuff full and three or four boxes. And I picked out 300 records. And we worked out a deal and I got them reasonable. I didn't know at the time the rarest Carter family record ever made was in there. I picked it out. Which record is that? Bear Creek Blues, Conquer, sold for one day uh, from certain Sears store. I don't think they only had a few copies. I don't know how that came about. The other side came out on two other labels. It was just the Bear Creek Blues side. It was cut in Chicago in 1940. They, they had a big session. In fact, they were really great. Whoever ran that session knew what they were doing as far as sound quality. So I had to drag them. <laughs> I got to the foot log. I took my pants off, my shoes, and put the records on the foot log and drug, slide them across real slow because if they'd have fell in there, they'd been gone. And when I got back on the other side, then I redressed and uh, drug them for a mile till I got down where I could see the car, and then I got smaller boxes and walked back up. I didn't find out about the Carter family record until later on. I didn't, 
guy in Chicago didn't believe it existed, and he came all the way down to take a look at it. Pretty rare. Um, it's been uh, how many years? Fifty-seven years or more since I found it. Never seen another one. The mythology <clears throat> that I hear, or the folklore that I hear, is that you have the only complete set of Carter family records in existence. I believe there might be one other set. Uh, I'm not sure. I know one fellow that has them all, but the Conqueror. That's the big one. And it just happened that, happened that they had a few copies. I don't think it was 100 or less. And so one day. I was in Nashville in 57. Uh, me and Jim, he wanted to go to Opry. We, kept, we were down in Florida, and I got a sunburn you wouldn't believe. I couldn't touch anything for a week. So we came back up. I want to go to Opry. I said, you're going to be disappointed. I said, no, I used to go. This was 57. I said, well, I want to go. All right. So we went. It was a Friday night. It was awful. Some guy down on the stage beating that boop, out of a snare drum. I said, that's it. I'm going to get my money back. And Jim said, I'm getting mine back. So we went up front. Got my money back. Why? What's wrong? I said, what's wrong? I come down here to country music. That's some idiot beat the drum. <laughs> <laughs> so we, see, after 55, everything went to boop. Did you at least, were there any names on the Opry that night? Was Roy Acuff or Bill Monroe? No, 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 no. Roy Acuff lived on the Opry, at the Opry, to keep it traditional. He did everything he could until he died, and that was the end of it. Anyway, we went down the stairs, and I ran into Sam McGee, one of the best country guitar players that ever lived. And we ended up back at the Opry house in his old Chevrolet car for four hours, him telling stories, and I didn't have a tape recorder. Oh. He said they had a banjo contest where the performer performed behind a curtain so nobody could tell who it was. And he won. He beat out Dave Macon. And Dave was, he said, Macon was ready teed off. <laughs> so he, Sam played a six string banjo guitar. Oh, he made one record that, what, what was that one? Uh, Chevrolet car, an easy rider. Phew, what a record. Okay, and I issued in 28. I found three copies in a store, brand new. I wish they had the other two <laughs> now. <laughs> but he was a he was unbelievable. He said Dave making word him to death to go to New York. I said Sam, come on, go to New York. He said they'll love you up there. They'll, we're, they'll make a record of you. And he said I really didn't want to go. He said finally he talked me into it. And he said we drove from Nashville to Knoxville, took three days. He said every creek we came to, you had to put water in that damn old Model T. <laughs> <laughs> And they didn't know bridges. He had to drive through the rivers in those days. And they went up there, and uh, he recorded Knoxville Blues, which I have a beautiful copy of. Buck Dancer's Choice and Franklin Blues. That's a hard one to find. And <clears throat> he, I had this record of Knoxville Blues that I found near Front Royal, Virginia. It had this terrible feedback. <laughs> when Uncle Dave was on there talking. He said, oh, folks, this is Tom McGee from Tennessee. Just to get right. Let's go, Sam. And he picked the guitar, and Uncle Dave would, you know, I guess, and yeah, I was born to die, you know. And it had this terrible feedback. So I found another copy that didn't have it. So I asked Sam about that. He said, yeah. He said, they had problems. He said, we had to do it over. Somehow or another, the stamper got mixed in, and they pressed a few copies before they found out about it. I, I've never found another copy with the feedback in it. Now the other the other one I, I a fellow in Ashland, Kentucky found it like an E plus copy in the big troll. I said I got that. And I was oh, geez. to find that record in that condition. He was an unbelievable guitar player. Played open D, three finger style. You know. Yeah. Best records were made were Columbia. Anything because they were laminated. They had this. It looked like pancakes. And they had a mixture of tar and stuff. They put uh, they put one pancake a label down facing up. You know out. Then he put one of the tars. Then he, in the middle was a block of this, like, tar or whatever mixture. Then he put another pancake over on top and then stick the label on that and put it in that thing, you know, and stick it in 70 tons. And that was your record. It had a good surface. Anything Columbia pressed, if you had a test pressing on vinyl right off the same stamper, it wouldn't be any better than the record pressed. I've heard people much smarter than me saying that that was the best quality records that were ever made. I mean, what they were doing is fantastic. You don't hear through my speaker system at home. Western Electric, of course, had it. They invented it uh, in 1920. 
but none of the companies wanted to touch it because it was too expensive. So they went on with the horn, acoustical, mechanical. There was a guy in Chicago that made a label called Autograph, extremely rare. In 1925, he was, he was recording electrically. You could tell it. He was ahead of everybody. And then in 1925, when radio was really inroading in Columbia and Victor, they had the Bucks finally got it, and that revolutionized records. But I think if he had to pick the surface, Paramounts were, oh, oh, oh. Paramount Furniture Company, they scraped the sawdust off, off, off the floor, mixed it with molasses and tar, pressed Paramounts. <laughs> 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 and some of the best stuff in the world was on that. I, I mean, I got some Paramounts that played beautiful, and then some that looked good, but terrible. Well, so you have a large collection, but it's a very, very high quality. Yeah, I, I slimmed it down. I'm down to 15000 now. You know, I sold a few things. I'm not getting any younger, and uh, may as well, you know, a guy offers big money for a record. And I've sold some. Most of it's early country. Well, Ike Robertson, Sally Good in 1922. Country music was over in 55. After that was bluegrass. I uh, also collect... Um, Swing, early swing, but uh, black gospel, black lady singers, black blues, uh, Cajun, you know, all kinds of stuff. See, the trouble with me when I when I collected, I collected all of it. Most of the time, a guy that collected jazz, you know, he'd pick out some good country stuff. Oh, I'll trade you for a jazz record. I didn't, couldn't do that because I, I wanted to keep everything. I liked <laughs> all of it. Oh, I got a lot. I, I cameraed uh, Johnson City, Tennessee. Years ago, for the Richitone Records, they were only sold down there. And you would just go door to door to people's houses. We went to radio stations, and they were dumping all that stuff. Oh yeah, I went to house to house. Oh yeah, that's fun. I want to be sure that people know that when you were doing this, most people didn't want this stuff. No, there was there might have been a few other guys out doing it too. You know, I went to one house. <clears throat> Lady came out and was talking. She said, "Well, there were two men here a month ago looking for records, but I didn't like them. <laughs> she liked me, <laughs> and they're the ones that's got the good stuff because she had all kind of Montgomery Wards, Blue Sky Boys, in decent shape. They're, they're my favorites. That's, <laughs> that's great Sky stuff. <clears throat> oh yeah, they, they were beautiful. Fourteen and seventeen years old when they recorded the nineteen thirty six. But it's all kind of stuff like that. And I got a lot of jazz." Jazz was over in 33. After that, forget it. Oh, by the way, um, all records up until late 28 were 76 RPM. All played, everybody plays them too fast. We wonder why Sarah Carter's voice sounded so high on those Victor Bristol sessions. <clears throat> so we started slowing them down. We got them down to 76 and it was normal. And in fact, I had a guy came in with a bass saxophone. You ever see one of those things? Yeah. Whew. And he could play it. <clears throat> I put on some Frankie Trimbrow. I think that's the way you pronounce it. He had bass sax on that. And he says something wrong. He says the sax is out of tune. He says, Joe, he says saxes don't go out of tune. So I started slowing down. We got down to 76. He said, that's it. That's that's where it was recorded at. So all, all the stuff I play on the radio, I play at 76. That's a normal speed. Well, somebody- I think by 29 or 30, they went to 78. But I, I said I went out. Every time I had any money, I, I went out. I mean, when I first started, gas was 16, 17 cents a gallon. You took 50 bucks, you could stay out a week. Um, you could get a nice lunch, hot beef sandwich, mashed potatoes, and a Coke for 50 cents. I spent more money on eats than I did records. Yeah. You got to see the real American. Yeah, I got in some for these. weird places, man. <laughs> All kind of stuff. It, um, Bluefield, Virginia was a good place. The blacks and the whites had jobs, railroad and coal mine. So they bought records. And there was a Bluefield Music Company handled all the labels. I used to find them, you know, Bluefield Music Company, open evenings. <laughs> 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 and that's where I've, below there is where I found the Black Patties. Uh, the one is the only known copy. Did you know what it was when you found it? No. I, I, I went out looking for this flea market. And I made a long turn. <laughs> the best long turn I ever made. And I got down the road about a mile, and there's this fellow walking up the other side of the road. And I stopped. I said, where's the flea market? He's up there. I said, you going up there? And he said, yeah. I said, hop in. I always had somebody with me. 
when I went on trips because somebody watched a car when I was in the houses, you know. And we had the tape player going. He said, oh, you getting that on the radio? I said, no. He said, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> he knew better when nothing I got on the radio. And I told him we was looking for old records. And he said, I got a bunch of them back at the house. So we went to the flea market. It was nothing. So we went back to his house and about 20 miles. He lived up the back of an old trailer court. You all seen that place. I would have never found that road. Anyway, he had to live in a shotgun shack. You know what that is, don't you? <clears throat> and we walked halfway through and went a right turn in the bedroom, and he pulled this box out from under the bed. It must have had three feet of bed dirt and dust. It looked like snowing, <laughs> like a blizzard. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and there was uh, Uncle Dave making a bouquet, pretty worn, a Carter family, a few other Charlie Poole, and then I hit the first black patty. I was like, oh, my Lord. <laughs> I said, geez. And I laid it aside. You got... Picked out two, three other records, and there was two black patties. There was three. There was four. Oh, God. I got 15 out there. He said, you kind of like them, don't you? I said, yeah, they're really w w weird. I said, where'd you get those? He said, some man gave them to our da my daughter, or my sister, in 1920. said, we didn't like them. So they shoved them in a box and shoved them under the bed, waiting for me to come along 80 years later and get them. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I, I got back home and I called Mike Stewart. He was a good friend of mine, excellent guitar player. He passed away uh, a couple of years ago. And he was dealing in records, had auctions. I said, Mike, I hit it this time, 15 black patches. Oh, give, don't give me any of that. Boop. <laughs> <laughs> he what are they? And I started reading them off and I got to the Long Cleave Reed, Papa Harvey Hall, and didn't hear anything. Mike, you still there? He says, I'll call you back. About 10 minutes later, phone rang. Hi, Joe. This is Bernie Klatsko in New York. He said, I heard about your terrific find. He says, you're going to be home tomorrow. I want to come down. I got to hear this record. I said, yeah. So he came down. He like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know? <laughs> he said, here's $10,000. You just show up for that? I said, no. So he, he said, well, take 800 of it and put it on tape. I want to put it out on my LP. So I'm. I taped it for him. And the next day, uh, Don Kent called. I heard you about your beautiful find. I said, yeah, Bernie's been down there. What do you, what do you offer you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, 10 grand. He said, I'll double it. I said, no, I don't want to sell it. I said, Bernie gave me $800, $400 aside to put it on LP. He said, I'll give you $800. He said, I'll wait and put it out later. So they did. And then other people got to hear it. And now it's way up and way up. Well, the Black Patties, there were like three or four really great ones. Jeanette Records pressed them for Mayo Williams. He won them named after Black Patty, which was a black opera singer. I got a beautiful picture of her at home. And when she performed, she wore peacock feathers. So the label, which Fred Jeanette pressed, Jeanette Pre Records pressed. Richmond, Indiana. Had the top of the label. You ever seen one? Yeah. You know, the top was a whole peacock with its feathers spread out. Yeah. Beautiful, unbelievable label. They had real artists. It's one of the prettiest labels. And there were 55 different ones, and a lot of them came out on Jeanette and Champion as well. They're still rare on Black Patty, but the, the one I have is only on Black Patty. Um, original Stack of E Blues, about E minus. They never played them. That was the find of a lifetime. It's like finding the rarest thing you collect. And it's the only one. Pete Whelan, he had a big collection, but he put this magazine out. And he said he checked with every collector he knew. Nobody's ever seen that record in any condition. And he believes that it is the only copy. Now, one may turn up. You never know. It's been 50 years since I found this one. So that's my baby. I like that for <clears throat> But Maybe. it's a fantastic hobby. I mean, to me, it's the best time. You can, the, the labels, the work of art, and you can look at them, and you can see them spinning around, but you can drop that needle down and hear all that good music. Oh, I we could go on all day. We could go on all day. <laughs> I really appreciate you hey, sharing stories no, no with me. No problem at all. It's, it's fun. It's beautiful. To, we could go on for... I got, a, I, I got enough for another hour. <laughs> you going to go looking for records right now? Yeah, occasionally. You know, me and Bernie here... Uh, or Benny, we went out a few places, and everything's closed today now. You know. I wish you guys luck on the. On the I did find a couple down here. 
I got them over here in the box. 